Good evening guys and welcome to the Sports Service Centre. Uh, tonight we're going to have a little bit of talk um, about some strength and conditioning and what a strength and conditioning coach is and what they can do. Um, but before we get started, I just would like to go through some housekeeping rules with you guys. So if anybody needs a toilet, please just put up your hand and let me know. Now if you go back out to the door where we came from and you head back down, towards reception, just on the left is the male and the female locker rooms. So you guys are welcome to, to head in there when you need to. And also in the case, or in the unlikely case of an emergency, there is, um, we, we would actually head out down through this back corridor and out onto the oval, and that's where our warden will come up and let us know what we need to do next. But I've been teaching here for a long time and I'm yet to have to <laughs> head down the other way. So, level one strength and conditioning coach, and also a PT here at the gym. So, you guys are obviously all here on your school camp. So, are you guys involved in sport? What sports do you guys play? Soccer. Soccer, yeah. Any others? Rugby league. Yeah, cool. I'm a rugby league boy from north of England originally. I was a boxer. Boxer? We've actually got some of the PNG guys here today from the PNG Olympic Committee. Boxes, yeah. Any others? Netball. Netball as well. You're just, you're just nah. multiple sports. You're just making this up. <laughs> All right. So what we're going to do is we're just going to go through a little bit about strength and conditioning and the strength and conditioning coaches and what they can do for you if you wanted to become an athlete or you wanted to improve your performance in a particular sport. Have any of you guys had um, a experience using a strength and conditioning coach? Or do you guys, you know, you just done sort of PE at school, that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah no, one's, no one's done anything like that. How do you do it? So, like, if, if you're playing like red level rugby league, for example, those teams may potentially have a strength and conditioning coach that comes in and does some work with the athletes. Oh, yeah. In terms of programming, making a program for you guys, going through yeah. some exercises, that sort of thing. And were they a strength and conditioning coach or a PT? Oh, you don't really know. Both, yeah. Bit of both. Okay, cool. Well, what we're going to do is we're just going to go through a little bit of stuff where, so by the end of this session, you guys hopefully will have um, a little bit more of a basic understanding of athlete preparation, the objectives of a strength and conditioning program, some dominant physical qualities, uh, planning and periodization, training variables, and RPE, which is the rated perceived exertion. Some flexibility, long-term athletic development, and some body weight progressions and protocols. So components for an athlete. What do you reckon the four components are for an athlete before while they get prepared? Okay, just write down four things on your bit of paper. What do you reckon they would be? Four components, okay, of sports performance. What are the, those components? What would they be? Is it just physical? Not necessarily. So just write down four answers and I'll just fire out and see what you come up with. You can talk among yourselves. Bounce some ideas around. I like an interactive yeah, session. Bounce it around. That's it. You do netball and so on. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sleep, training, food. Nutrition. Yeah, yeah, you're on the right track. You're on the right track. So the very first one, did anybody put mental? Yeah. Uh, trust it out. Oh, yeah. You, you put it down and trust it out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, before you do anything, you've got to be mentally prepared. You've got to be ready. Mm -hmm. So that would like to sleep do it. Be in it. Sorry. Yeah, that would be part of recovery, so that would be an important part. But that's not so much of preparation. Um, it's part of that's part of the physical preparation. Okay. So the other one is your tactical preparation. So that's when you sit down with your coach and the coach explains the game plan and tells the team or the athlete how they're going to go about the competition. The third one is technical skills. That's where, like in soccer, you work with your technical coaches. You go through your drills and you practice your corners and different things like that. And then the last one is your physical preparation, and that is getting the body ready to be able to 
deal with the demands of that sport. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah? Any questions? Okay, so the objectives of a strength and conditioning program are to ultimately improve the performance of an athlete at their chosen sport, whatever it may be. So you can imagine there's a whole heap of different sports and all those different sports have totally different attributes to work with. So your physical preparation has to be very specific to what you want to do. Okay? So what a strength and conditioning coach can do for you guys is individualise a program to suit you. Even when you work as part of a big team, your strength and conditioning coach will have a file for each and every athlete and individualise it and go through the strengths and weaknesses of that particular person, not the team as a whole. That's for the coach. So we improve the athlete's base strength level and improve the power output if that's required for that particular sport. What sports do you reckon would need power output? Yeah, definitely. Definitely weightlifting. Yeah. There was a big clue on the slide. <laughs> well done. What other ones? Rugby league. Yeah, rugby league. What, what other sports what? might sprinting. require power? Like power training. Sprinting. Exactly, yeah. Sprinting is a perfect example. The explosive start. So we have to develop correct exercise skills and drills and techniques. We don't expect you guys to come straight out of school, go into the gym and start smashing out clean and jerks and all that sort of thing. There's a progression in all this. So your strength and conditioning coach will go through that progression and teach you right from the beginning the correct way to do all the different exercises. We can improve sport specific movements through speed and agility sessions. Like when you're playing soccer, you can do your cone drills, the ladder drills and all that sort of thing. But just a quick point on that. There's been a lot of studies done recently about how an athlete would improve by going through predetermined and pre learned drills like when you do the agility ladder. You guys have all done that before? Yeah. So you can go through certain different footwork drills, but in the end your body adapts to that and you learn what to do before you do it. So the best way to improve your agility and speed is to play small based games or small sided games. And they've proven that that a lot a big part of Real agility is seeing how your opponent moves and anticipating what they're going to do and moving towards that. So by, the only way you can do that is by playing games against each other. And so that's much more effective than doing static drills that you can learn. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we can increase an athlete's mobility and flexibility, physical conditioning and endurance, and we can continually assess the athlete's progress as we go through. So this is the difference between a personal trainer and a strength and conditioning coach. Most personal trainers can go to lots of different types of uh, courses, RTOs, you can do it through TAFE. There's lots of different ways to do it. Um, once you become qualified you can work in the gym and then you're working with more so sort of the general population, people who just want to exercise to keep fit, lose some weight or put a little bit of muscle on. Whereas a strength and conditioning coach is usually university um, taught. They've usually got some sort of a degree like human movement, something like that. And then they have to go through uh, the Strength and Conditioning Association's courses to get their coaching accreditation. So they're much more likely to be working with teams and individuals who are focused on one particular sport. They may even work with athletes ranging from a whole heap of different sports. Okay, But that's the biggest differences um, between the strength coach and the personal trainer. Any questions? Alright. The dominant types of physical qualities that can be trained. It's pretty straightforward. Strength, we've got general strength, maximal strength, and strength endurance. We've got acceleration and top speed. We have aerobic endurance and anaerobic endurance and muscular endurance. Do you guys know what the difference between those things are? What would be the difference between aerobic endurance and anaerobic endurance? One uses oxygen. Yes, that is, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. yeah, so one, when you're doing aerobic, you're working at a moderate pace over a long period of time. So you get plenty of oxygen as you go. But when you do anaerobic, then you're doing really short, sharp bursts, and you get oxygen deprived, and you have to recover to keep going. 
that you can build endurance in both things. Okay? And then we've got flexibility. Now having flexibility will help you prevent injuries, it will help you stay mobile, and by being mobile that will transfer through to your sports performance in any particular sport. So, we'll have a look at the fastest human on the planet. Do you reckon he was born or built? So I'll just chuck that on. That's when he, won, when he beat the world record and he pulls up short. He doesn't even run full pelt to the line. He's already pulling up there. And he still beats the world record. So what do you reckon? Born or built? Hey, slow. Born? Hey. Well, you you've got slow um, twitch muscle fibers in the past. Yeah, that's right. And you can only move more on this like a certain amount of each. But do you think you can you can gain more? Yeah, can you work on your fast twitch muscles? Can you gain more fast twitch muscles? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I know born, some people are born as more. But... So some people are more naturally gifted. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? I watched a documentary about how he trains. I don't know if you guys have seen anything like that, but pretty much every training session he does, he will vomit <laughs> because he goes harder than any human I've ever seen on the training track. And you can see when he transfers that into competition, he's better than the rest because he puts in more effort and more intensity into every training session than his competitors. I think that's why he's as good as he is. Okay? So if we look at all these different sports, obviously a lot of these sports would rely on more than one particular attribute. For example, soccer relies on speed and endurance, but you also need some strength and you've got to be flexible. So, sprinting relies upon strength and power for your start, but you also got to have top speed and you need to be flexible. Okay, so a question for you, what about netball? What do you reckon? Agility would be huge, so stop, start. Anything else? Flexibility. Yeah, flexibility yeah, across the board. You need strength agility. To pass the ball. Yeah, you would need some strength. You need speed. Speed's a good one. Speed, you would need takeoff speed in netball. You need to be able to be fast from standing start and oh. get Yeah, and that's power. Okay. So you can see if you're working with an athlete and the athlete comes as a strength coach, you can't just say, Okay, we're just going to make you strong, easy. You can't say that because everything you do to make this athlete strong may actually make them slower. So you have to try to balance this whole picture of a, the overall athlete and the overall sport. So when you look at the different disciplines of what a strength and conditioning coach can do, basically they'll set up all your training, and your training might even be over, over a four year period. When you first meet your coach, they might say, okay, you're an Olympic athlete, so we need you to peak in four years' time. So they will make every training session and everything you do for the next four years to aim for that goal in four years. Some athletes even sacrifice doing well at the World Championships 
which is two years away from the Olympics because they want to get that gold medal at the Olympics. And so if that doesn't match their training protocols, they don't want to peak here and then they won't peak over there. So all this is mapped out sometimes as much as four, even eight years in advance for a particular athlete. And then obviously we've got strength training, speed and agility, metabolic and endurance, Balance, balance stability and proprioception, and then our flexibility, recovery, and rehabilitation. So your strength coach can give you training and protocols and a, a program that incorporates all of these different things to make you a be better athlete at your particular sport. So proprioception, does anybody know what that means? No. Never heard that before. Is it the awareness of the body? Yes. Oh my God. Oh, you just read that off there. Sorry. Okay. So it's the awareness of our body position. Okay. So parts of our muscles and joints sense the position of our bodies and they send messages to your brain. And we depend on this information so we know what we're doing. So proprioception is how you can stand on one leg. It's how you can walk without looking at your feet. It's how you know how to just pick up a fork, you can put it in your food and put it in your mouth without stabbing yourself in the cheek. All of that is proprioception, okay? And so obviously it's really, really important to have good proprioception and you can train it. It can be trained, okay? It's very much like when you first learn to play the guitar. If you try to play the guitar, when you first try, you'd be stumbling, your fingers would be all over the place, you'd have to look at what you were doing with your fingers. Once you've done it for a little while, you start to pick it up, your mind, the, the connection between your fingers and your mind would be racing because you've done it over and over again repetitively and then you could do it without looking. Okay, So it's the same thing with exercise and with proprioception. You, the more you train this sort of stuff, the more, the better you'll become at doing it. And of course, it's really good and it transports into any sort of sport, Okay, knowing where you are and how much pressure, pressure to exert. So planning. Essential for all training programs. What do you think would be something important for planning? What would you say you would need to do if you, because you can you can put some of these things into your own into your own and training. You don't necessarily need your coach. You, you can do these things yourself. Okay, so you're playing soccer. Okay, you're going to play soccer this year. Not netball. We're over netball. We're playing soccer. Okay. So what are you going to do first? You've got to think, okay, I'm going to play soccer, but I don't want to be rubbish at soccer. I want to be a gun. So what would you think you would have to do to even begin to be a good player? Understand the rules. Understand the rules, that's a good one, but more on the physical side of things. The preparation, is it? Yeah. First of all, we'd have to look at the sport, okay, and determine what physical qualities are required for that sport at the desired level you want to play? Okay. So if you want to play soccer and you just want to play at school, you have to realise what are the best players at school doing? What are they good at? Are they on target? Are they fast? Are they super fit? Can they run all day? What do these guys do that makes them so good? Or do you want to play rep level? Then you look at those, what those guys do. And then you look at what attributes make them such good players. And so you start to look at all those through, right through to Olympic Games level or to grassroots level. And you look, you watch the players, you see what they do. Okay? And this is exactly what a strength coach would do for you, but there's no reason why you can't do this for yourselves. Then you would make an assessment on the qualities of the athlete, which means yourself in this case. So you have a look at what you're already good at, what you're not so good at, what is what's makes you strong, what makes you weak. Then you have a look at your injuries, uh, any short or long term implications that that may have on training. Okay, So if you've recently had a knee reconstruction, you wouldn't jump straight back into training, you'd have to rehab that knee before you can start training. Does that make sense? And then you have to develop a plan of what you need to do and what type of training is required. And then we develop a timeline to put that plan together. Yeah, that makes sense? So that's what in strength and conditioning world is called periodization.
Have you guys heard of that before? No? No. Okay, so periodization is basically um, an approach to training that involves progressive cycling of the different attributes that we're trying to teach or trying to improve on. So for example, for your soccer player, you need to improve in your endurance, and you also need to improve in your strength, and you also need to improve in your flexibility. So what the coaches might do is say, okay, for the next six week block, we're working on strength. Okay, it's pre-season, we're not having to play any games, so we're going to work on strength. We're going to get strong for the start of the year. And you do a six week block where you don't do much endurance, and you put all your energy in to get your body stronger. And then after that six weeks, we might say, okay, we're coming in towards the beginning of the season, we need to build on our endurance, but we need to maintain that strength. Okay, so your whole training routines will completely change. And then it's the, it's the sports that play every week, like soccer, rugby league, rugby union. They're the ones that are the trickiest sports of all. Because every week you need to play a game, you need to recover, you need to, uh, you need to keep your strength up, you need to keep your endurance up, you need to hone all your skills, you need to get your tactics right, and then you need to play again. You need to do all that in a week. An Olympic athlete might only have to do that two or three times a year. For a swimmer, for example, they might only have three meets in a year. Okay, the soccer player's got to do it every week. So that's where periodization becomes very, very important. So you'll have your strength coach will give you a yearly phase and he'll break that down into six week phases and then he'll break that down into a week and then into a day and then into a session. Okay, so the strength coaches get pretty busy. But does that make sense? How they just handle that? Alright, so training variables. Exercises and protocols must be selected with a specific sport of the athlete in mind. Progressive overload, you've all heard of that before? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, cool. And, and specific specificity, individualization, <laughs> variation and recovery techniques. It's changed a lot. Yeah, it has changed a lot, I like it. Yeah, you like, like, like a bit more. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you like the pepper? Sorry, I have <laughs> All right, so we need to understand the exercises, exercise training protocols and the effect that it have on the athlete, like we just spoke about. If we increase strength, we don't want to decrease our endurance. If we want to increase hypertrophy, get bigger, we don't want that to make us inflexible. So you have to be very careful the way you balance all these things out. We also need to consider negative effects that we can have on musculoskeletal and nervous system um, as well. And we need to get out there and use multi-joint free weight exercises. You guys have much experience doing out in the gym? Yeah, you guys all go to the gym? Yeah. Cool. And do you train with a partner, with a trainer? Yeah. Just by yourself? And do you train in at school, at the gym in school? You guys go to gym at school? Yeah. yeah, cool, that's great. So lifting weights can be beneficial for all athletes. Even if you were a marathon runner, you see those guys are pretty lean, but those guys can still get a lot of benefits from um, uh, building muscle and strength as well. So athletes should always develop good technique before attempting to increase load, and that's where your strength conditioning uh, coach will come in and give you progressions of every exercise. So you'll start at a very, very basic level and you'll have to be able to meet all the scores of, of the progressions as we go along to make sure that you're doing every exercise properly. Now we, we've all heard the term failure, so when you fail, when you're in the gym and you fail, most people think when you fail, if you're trying to do a bicep curl, you're trying to, when you fail and you cannot physically lift that weight up anymore. That is not 100% true. Failure means when your technique breaks down. So if you're doing a bicep curl and you can no longer do a bicep curl like that, you're starting to do it like that, that's failure. You've already failed. Okay? It's so important to get the full range of motion and do every exercise for every rep 100% correct. As soon as you can't do it, that's it. Okay? If you carry on until you fully fail, then you could definitely injure yourself. Okay. And obviously when you start doing a lot bigger lifts and you're doing heavy squats or front squats or a clean jerk, um, if you try to go too heavy or your technique breaks down, then it can end in real disaster. Okay. Then we've got the super comp compensation fatigue curve. That's 
not really as complicated as it looks. That's pretty simple. If your training is too difficult, you won't be able to recover and then when you try to go back to the gym, you won't have the energy to lift up to that next level. If your training is too easy, okay, you won't reach that next level of the super compensation. So your training needs to be just right. And how do we measure it? How do we measure your um, performance each time? So this is how the athletes do it. Okay? So what we do is we put, uh, we have what we call the RPE, which is the, received, the rating perceived exertion of a particular session or gym session. Okay? So what you do is if you're doing your conditioning and skills, you rate the session on what you've done out of 10. So this was, that was a particularly hard session and you just times that by the duration you did it for. And that gives you a score. At the end of the week, you can total up this score and that will let you know how hard your week was. Does that make sense? So that way you can tell each week that you're training how hard it was. So I'm not sure what this, who this is for, but I can tell you that a rugby league player in the NRL, his total figure here, what do you reckon it would be? Rugby league? Yeah. Like 2,000. 2,500. Mm -hmm. No, double. 4,000. 4,000 in a week. That's huge. That's why when it comes to the end of the year, half the rugby league players are injured. Yeah, because it, it's tough, the training is tough. Yes? Um, I've got a goal, I've got laser scanning. Yeah, cool, that's fine. You go. Uh, go for it. Thank you. I would not want you to come back in here and shoot me down with a laser. <laughs> Lucky it's laser and not paintballs. Don't do that. Alright, then flexibility. So you guys have heard of static stretching and dynamic stretching. Yes? No. Yeah? So which one should you do before exercise? Yeah, and after exercise. Uh, what happens if you do static stretching before exercise? Yeah, so what could happen? Injury. Injury, that's right, yeah. But it also takes away from your performance. If you static stretch beforehand and then go and do your training session, you won't be able to do as well as if you didn't stretch. It actually tires your muscles out and fatigues, fatigues your muscles as well. Okay, but obviously stretching is very, very important. We're all guilty of not stretching enough, okay? Not dynamic, not warming up dynamically enough and not stretching afterwards. I can't stress how important it is. I have um, had torn hamstrings, all things like that, as a young fella from not doing it. And it's, it's easy for me to stand up in here and say, please do it. But I know it's sometimes difficult and there's time constraints. But when you're sitting at home and you're watching TV, Jump on a foam roller, do some of this myofascular release work. Okay? Use a ball, keep your muscles relaxed and released as much as you can. Okay? And there's different types of stretching too. Uh, have you guys heard of PNF stretching? <coughs> no? No one's heard of that? So that's like partner stretching, that's where you, your partner can actually extend the stretch a little bit more to give you more. To, so you can get that extra little bit, but you only should do that when you're really warmed up. Okay, you shouldn't be doing it when you pay. So the example would be um, you get your partner to sit down in front, cross legs with his arms behind his back, and then you would just gently come in behind him and just pull his elbows back, so he's stretching his chest out. And then after about 30 seconds, you'd ask him to push his elbows towards you as hard as he can, and you would hold his arms back. And then he would do that for five seconds, and then he would release, and you would stretch him, and you're getting that a little bit further. Okay? And so that can make him more and more flexible. Yeah? Is that a little dangerous? It's dangerous if you don't warm it up. Yeah. And obviously, your, your partner has got to feel it, but by, by pushing really hard against and flexing those muscles and contracting those muscles, you'll find that it will go a little bit further. So you have to be very careful when you do it and you obviously have to trust your training partner. Yeah. So it can be dangerous if it's done wrong. Okay? But the best way to work on your flexibility, if you want to increase flexibility for your sport, is actually do it in standalone sessions. Okay? Actually go into the gym and do a stretch session. Do it for half an hour, 40 minutes. 
okay? And that's all you would do. You would go through a whole heap of different stretches, okay? So we get teams coming here. We had the Crusaders in here last week, and uh, an elite team like that would come in and do a stretch session for an hour, and they would have like a recovery relax session. They might do it after they've been in the pool or something like that. So that's the best way to increase it. And then we've got long-term athletic development. Now this is just something that the, the sports scientists put together, which basically puts you at a certain age range, at age range and then it itemizes where you are and what stage you're at. So you guys are obviously starting to train to compete now. But they put this together so that we can get young kids active and get them doing all the right things so that by the time they get to training to compete and training to train, they already know these movements, they've already got this proprioception happening, they've already got these things in place. And then it goes right through to being active for life. It doesn't matter how old you are or when you start. We do a bit of a practical session. Um, just a little bit of way that you can progress a simple exercise like a push-up. Okay? So this would be the same principles would apply to every exercise that you learn in the gym. So if everyone would just jump up, and I'll show you some different ways that you can do just a simple push-up. Alright, who, who's good at push-ups? Who's no good at push-ups? Everyone can do a push-up now. Yeah, so anyway, the, so the easiest way to do a push-up, and if someone had never done a push-up before, the easiest way to do a push-up would be to kneel next to the wall, keep your body nice and straight, and just roll into the wall and push yourself back up. That would be the very first progression of a push-up. So everyone just give that a try. It's so easy, like you can do it. Ridiculous. Is that easy? Oh, hamstrings pulled, what is going on? Oh, 
That's it. Nice work. Oh. Cool. Uh, well done. Well, yeah. Yeah. All right, and then if we pull these out, we can we can make it. We can make the range of motion deeper, so we can do a deeper push up. Yes. So we go all the way down. So try that one. So obviously you can do this off kettlebells or off blocks, anything. So you get all the way down. That's great. Great right work. Very good. Cool. The pops. That was so easy. What are the weights to do? Yeah, so you just do the push-ups on the weights. So that way you get better range of motion, you get deeper into the into the push-up, because the ground doesn't get in the way. So you go all the way down. That's right. Then we can put a few more stability demands on it. So we can grab our bow suit, feet up. Alright, oh, that's sketchy. Okay. And then we can go down. So now we're starting to work on proprioception. Okay, who was up? <laughs> That's it, so now you're working on balance, stability, stability in the shoulders, all your muscles, all the core muscles are switching on. Beautiful. <laughs> good try. Hi, how are you going? That's good. Alright, nice work. And then before we start doing heavy bench presses and things like that, we can also improve by using these straps as soft resistances. So what we can do is put this around your back, across your back like that. Okay? Now this is the hard part, is getting on the floor without looking very weird. Okay, and then we want to put your hands and let your elbows come through the straps, and then we go down and do the push-up. Now normally when you do a normal push-up, when you get to the top you haven't really got any resistance on. But when you've got this band on, it's pulling you back to the ground. So when you're up here, that's almost the hardest part of the push-up. So I've got an easy band and a slightly harder band.
that to just core muscles with you, to keep yourself stable. You need to know your stag glass. I don't know. Oh, off the wall. I I I the same thing off the wall.